Hello everybody, my name is John Browett. I'm the General Manager of the CC-Link Partner Association in Europe. And what I have for you here today is a short presentation about time-sensitive networking, TSN. So let's uh, start out by looking at the agenda for today. So uh, I'm going to start with um, a, some background, so uh, some history about uh, how industrial networks have developed over the past few years and then we'll uh, take a look at what the current situation is and where we're trying to get to. Then we'll follow that with uh, an overview of what time sensitive networking is and what it can do and then we'll finish with a summary. So let's start out with the background. So for those of you who have been around the industry for a while, you'll know that um, back in the 1980s and earlier, the way that uh, industrial systems, machines and so on tended to communicate was with discrete wiring. So uh, this was inflexible, it was hard to maintain and it was expensive because if you needed to change something, then you basically had to rewire everything. So not very ideal, but for the time, that was really the only way to do things. So then, starting in the 1980s and onwards, we um, saw the introduction of field buses. So they improved the situation because they allowed you to connect different devices together in a system. But um, the idea was that um, rather than using this inflexible discrete wiring, you could now connect everything together using a single cable. So this um, made things a lot more flexible and easier to install, maintain and design, but um, they still weren't perfect. One of the main drawbacks was that individual field buses were not compatible with each other. So if you had field bus A and devices on that and you wanted to use them with field bus B, that generally wasn't possible because there was different physical layers involved and therefore there wasn't interoperability. So starting around the 2000s, we, started, we saw the introduction of industrial Ethernet. So um, the benefit that this introduced was that uh, you now had a standardized physical layer. Ethernet was the physical layer, and so therefore we now had a more standardized way of connecting things. But we still had some drawbacks. One of the main ones was that um, the performance of these networks, these, these networks were generally not deterministic. So you never were really sure when something was going to happen. So around the 2010s, we saw deterministic protocols starting to be introduced. So these were various different protocols, such as CC-Link IE, Profinet, and so on, which were introduced, and they put a deterministic layer on top of Ethernet. So at this point, this was when Ethernet really started to get going in automation, because we now had pretty much everything we needed to... Um, do what we needed to do. But then things changed, of course, when Industry 4.0 came along. And um, this now started adding additional demands to the networking scene. And uh, so now we needed high performance, we needed better interoperability, we needed security, and so on. So um, before we continue, let's just take a quick review about what is Industry 4.0. So um, as you've probably heard, there's been various iterations of industry over the years, starting with steam power, which was arguably Industry 1.0. And then we moved on to mass production. And then we saw electronics and IT arrive in manufacturing. And then finally, we ended up with Industry 4.0 a while back, which meant that um, we now saw a new concept being introduced into manufacturing. And really what Industry 4.0 comes down to is that it's the combination of three key components, as you see here. So the first thing is uh, the idea of cyber physical systems, which is, is basically what people in the past called mechatronics. The idea of a device or a system which combines both software and electrical and mechanical components together. And then you also, on the other side, have the Internet of Things, which is basically the idea of multiple 
billions, in fact, devices communicating with each other using internet technologies. And in fact, in automation, what you typically tend to hear talked about is the industrial internet of things, which is where determinism is a more key requirement, making sure things happen when they're supposed to. And then, of course, in the middle, we usually have a situation where these things are all communicating to the cloud in some way, so that we have a way to increase the transparency of our processes and therefore better manage them by being able to share data throughout the enterprise with anybody who needs to see it. So this is the really sort of like the key concept of what Industry 4.0 is all about. So where have we got to now? Well, we, um, we have these key points at the moment. So as we saw earlier, um, we've addressed the so-called field bus wars, as they were called at the time, by having a standardized, ruggedized infrastructure, which today is generally Ethernet. This has in turn provided increased transparency of our processes and the ability to manage them better by having improved convergence between what's called the operational technology area today, so basically the shop floor, and IT systems that are higher up that uh, deliver services to help manage manufacturing better. We also have multi-vendor interoperability now, so therefore um, we have the ability to combine different devices from different vendors on one network, and we have multiple different types of open industrial ethernet, as I'm sure you're familiar. And then finally, those networks in turn have delivered deterministic performance, so therefore we now have a situation where we know we have a continuous operation and we know when things are going to happen and there's no surprises in our processes operation. But as you might guess, um, things are not completely perfect yet. Um, we've still got a few problems to face. So um, the first one is that although we have open industrial ethernet today, we have many different types, or at least several different types. And so therefore these don't necessarily interoperable these don't necessarily interoperate very well with each other and so therefore this causes some issues with the implementation of industry 4.0 because we need to maintain the information flow between different islands of automation and um, we need to have a way to do that without um, impeding the convergence of operational technology and information technology as we go forward with manufacturing So where we are today is um, we're now basically what you could say is we're looking for the holy grail, which um, in this case is a converged network architecture. So what that means is um, we want to have a situation where everything is talking to everything else, no matter what it is, how many we have of them or where it is. The idea is just have one great big network where everything communicates with everything else and, and everything works just fine. And of course, so one of the key points about that is we want to be able to choose devices from anyone and still have them talk to each other, no matter what they are or how they do it. But then of course, there's, there's other key points to consider too. Like for example, in manufacturing these days, cybersecurity has become a very key concern. So we need to be able to make sure we keep the bad guys out. But at the same time, we also need to make sure that we keep our work is safe and to make sure that uh, all the processes are run in a safe manner. Uh, as we saw earlier, determinism is also another key element. We need to make sure that, for example, if we're running a high-speed packaging line, everything is tightly synchronized together, everything operates exactly as we expect it to, and there's no surprises about things not operating when we thought they would. We also need to make sure it's easy to maintain. Um, if we've got all these devices spread around everywhere, we need to make sure that we can keep them running easily and there's not going to be trouble when maintenance is required. Also, productivity is a key point. You know, we need to make sure that we can make as much stuff as possible and um, keep that production process running at high speed to um, do what we need to do. And, and so on. As you can see, there's, there's a long list of things that we're looking for. So, how are we going to get there? Well, 
one of the first things we're looking for in a, this kind of network architecture is bandwidth. As we saw earlier, Industry 4.0 is now creating a situation where we will have multiple devices generating lots of data and all trying to maybe transfer this data between each other. So therefore, there's going to be a, a metaphorical explosion, if you like, of data on the shop floor. And um, it's not just going to be on the shop floor, it's going to be shared from the shop floor to the cloud. And um, so therefore, this vast increase in data that we're starting to see now means that um, we're seeing a definite trend for industrial networks to move from what was usually a fairly typical 100 megabit Ethernet bandwidth in the past towards gigabit bandwidth today. And um, no doubt in the future, we'll also see that bandwidth increase further. But then we also need to consider, it is bandwidth the whole story? Certainly, it's uh, important to have the necessary capacity in the network to transfer all this data around and make sure that everybody has access to it and it can be handled in the necessary way. But at the same time, we're also going to be seeing a situation where we have multiple types of traffic, uh, possibly sharing the same network architecture. So for example, as well as our process control traffic going around and, and our things related to that, such as maybe motion control and safety control and so on, we also may be, might be seeing the need for doing things like streaming video over the network from uh, inspection cameras and quality control systems and so on. And maybe even perhaps emails and so on being exchanged between different systems with uh, information like perhaps quality information or shift logs or something else like this. So how would we be able to do that kind of stuff? Well, as probably you've guessed by now, um, the uh, solution to a lot of this, we believe, is time-sensitive networking, TSN. So uh, let's uh, spend a little bit of time exploring what time-sensitive networking is and, uh, and what, uh, how it works and um, what the benefits are. So uh, first of all, Time-sensitive networking is um, a group of standards that was that has been defined by the IEEE, uh, the Institution of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. And uh, they're all grouped together under the heading of IEEE 802.1. And um, this actually started out in a completely different industry from automation. It was actually uh, the, the broadcast industry. And uh, it, was easy, it was recognized early on that um, it could offer benefits in other industries too, and since then it has spread into industry, into automation, but it's also getting popularity in things like the automotive industry as well for communications inside cars too. So uh, basically what it is, it, it uh, resides at what they call the data link layer of the eight layer model of Ethernet, which uh, defines how everything works with Ethernet going all the way from the cable or wireless at the bottom the actual physical layer, if you like, all the way up to the applications that run on top. And um, so therefore, TSN is really mostly concerned with, uh, with layer two of this hierarchy. But the, the key point really, though, is that it provides a way for multiple network types, uh, multiple network traffic types, that is, to be combined on one network, uh, while also making the operation of that network uh, deterministic. So uh, let's dig a little deeper into um, some of the key concepts behind TSN and what actually makes it work. So one of the first key concepts is that of time synchronization. So um, that's defined by a particular IEEE standard as you see here. What it really comes down to is um, each device on the network knows what time it is. So um, you know if you say that to now it's 10 o'clock all the devices on the network know it's 10 o'clock at that point. So therefore they're all synchronized to each other and um, there's no variation in their performance in relation to each other. Um, it's a bit like that cliche you see in old war movies where they say, let's synchronize watchers. Everybody knows what time it is. They have a common time reference. 
and they all know when things are supposed to happen in relation to each other. Going on from that, though, there's another concept which is kind of key to the whole idea of that of uh, real-time scheduling. And um, re really how this works is that you have something called a time-aware shaper, which um, prioritizes the different types of traffic on the network by uh, reserving time for that traffic to, to travel across the network and also defining how important it is in relation to other types of traffic. And so basically what this means in real terms is that your essential data, maybe that that's related to the actual control of your process, gets there when it's supposed to get there, and uh, maybe less important stuff like perhaps, for example, video frames from a vision system um, where there's less critical need for it to arrive when it should do, um, that um, maybe takes second place. So therefore, you can make sure that your process is operating correctly and nothing's really interfering with that. And uh, so really what this comes down to is it allows you to have a good control over latency and jitter. So latency relates to the time it takes for traffic to travel across the network in general. And jitter usually relates to the idea of the variation in when that traffic may arrive. So what does this really deliver in terms of real world applications? So um, as, as we've been saying, the, the first benefit is that this now allows you to mix multiple traffic types on a single network architecture. So th this, this offers you the ability to, do, to lower your total cost of ownership, as, as it's said. So what this means is that um, throughout the life cycle of a project, you have the ability to um, reduce the cost of the engineering because maybe you only need one kind of network to connect everything together. So therefore that obviously has lowered system costs because there's going to be less hardware needed possibly. And in maintenance is probably going to be simpler because there's less to deal with. But at the same time, it offers you the ability as you see here to combine, to combine all these different network traffic types together. So you have maybe your normal process related traffic, you have maybe motion control, you have maybe safety control. You could possibly also have things like just normal TCP IP traffic. Again, you know, maybe like the example of vision frames that we used earlier. And then there's also the possibility to combine other kinds of networks together on, on this network too. So you have a very flexible, very capable uh, list of possibilities. And then of course, the final point is, is that TSN also guarantees determinism, so you can make sure that all this is happening exactly when it needs to, everything's synchronized properly, and everything's working in the way you want it to. But however, it's important to remember that TSN doesn't do everything. It's not a, a magical cure-all for everything we're trying to do in automation. Um, so the first thing to keep in mind is that really it's just a pipe. Um, it really is only intended to get your ones and zeros in your data from one place to another. And it doesn't really care what those ones and zeros are. They could be your critical process data. Um, they could be that somebody just hit an e-stop. They could be video frames from a vision system. They could be emails. They could be whatever, whatever you're putting on the network. It doesn't care. So this also raises the question, well, today in automation, what you typically see is that there are different kinds of protocols that exist that allow you to define things like safety control and motion control and also things like um, making things easier to configure a network by having device profiles and making maintenance easier by making it easy to switch those devices in and out and, and so on. TSN doesn't really address any of those things. Um, it, it doesn't care because it's it's down there at layer two and it's just focused on getting the data from one place to another when it needs to get there. So therefore, the need for higher level protocols to address these kind of topics still exists. Another thing to consider for the moment is uh, standardization. Um, as we saw earlier, the, the IEEE 802.1 standard set includes about 30 standards right now. And uh, some of them are finished and some of them aren't. And not all of them even relate to automation 
use cases in general. So um, right now you have a situation where a manufacturer is fairly free to decide how to implement TSN on their devices. And so therefore there's a possibility that at the moment, perhaps you could argue that um, there's some variation in what TSN is in some cases. So um, this has been worked on right now. The IEC and the IEEE have a working group, the IE the 60802 working group, and this is actually defining um, profiles for industrial automation to standardize all this. But the good news is that uh, for those of you who want to move forward with TSN right now because of the compelling benefits it offers, there's a very high chance that um, given the history of these working groups, there will be a high level of backwards compatibility in the future. So that for those of you who move forward with technology that's available now for TSN, there's a pretty low risk that you're going to run into trouble down the road. Because of course, um, while we're waiting for the output of these kind of working groups to be published, we need to move forward with projects that are ongoing now. And, um, we also need to think, well, okay, so we're doing a project that is important for today's needs, but also for things like TSN, how we're we going to make sure that we have a migration path for the future. So really coming back to the topic of the Holy Grail, we could say, you know, have we actually found it yet? And, and it's looking like probably we have most of what we're looking for now. As, as we've seen, TSN has the potential to deliver the foundation of a converged network architecture. As we saw, it offers the ability to combine multiple types of network traffic together. But of course, uh, for those of you who've been working in automation, you know that uh, the life cycle of projects tends to move very slowly. When you install a production line that maybe costs perhaps tens of millions of dollars, euros, pounds, whatever, um, then you're not going to write that off and move on to something else very soon just because some shiny technology has arrived you know typically these systems will be operated for often decades and there's a huge investment out there that um, will still be operated long time into the future yet so really for those of you who are working on current projects today the idea is to look for a technology that uh, can address the needs of what you have today while also providing a TSN migration path for the future So I hope that gave you um, some idea about what TSN is and what it can do and um, showed you how it will be offering the capability to deliver a converged network architecture uh, pretty much from today. But we also need to keep in mind about how we're going to integrate this with the existing plant infrastructure that we have now. And so therefore, really, the, the key point I would leave you with right now is that uh, you look for a technology that addresses current needs while providing a migration strategy for the future. So here at the CC-Link Partner Association, we believe we actually have that available and um, it's uh, called CC-Link IE TSN. So I think, and I believe now uh, the plan is to take some questions if anybody has any.